Okay, <clears throat> round two. We're talking about um, principle four, we are indifferent to the sale. Uh, the call that happened on November the 3rd. So here we go. We've got perennial abundance, Tom and Nate. We're changing our approach and targeting, excuse me, targeting gazelles. Should we update, reform, remove some of our portfolio from our website? I'm wondering if some of the work we have posted, they would deter any potential gazelles from calling us. Gazelles have thumbs, of course. They can type into pad, no problem. Might we pare it down or maybe uh, it is fine as it is and it shows our growth. Great. So, um, Susan's example pointing to my example, Rob's conversation, he doesn't share, um, all good points, especially Rob's on, do you have analytics? Do you have a sense of, of being able to track that information and getting data on it? Um, Rob and I have two different approaches on this, which is great because it shows we have two different examples and we're both still really able to do what it is we need to do. Uh, and so it, it, it really shows that you work with integrity and, uh, you know, everything is kind of under the sun. Um, I'll tell you why I do it. Uh, and hopefully that can give you a sense of why you may want to do it. And uh, Rob's told you why he doesn't do it. And, you know, you can take it as that. I also, I really like Rob's approach. It's um, his ad copy. He's been, he's been very intentional with what he's done with his website. Black and white gives a real big message you know it's a black or white conversation especially working with an engineer you can do this but here's the implications you can't do this here's the implications uh the ad copies tight very very tight and then you really get a sense that this is a professional premium company they're not telling you a lot about anything um you're gonna have to call them and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation which again is very rare in the world so really consider what's rare in the space and move towards what's rare because it stands out and really helps you to differentiate. I found that there wasn't a lot of good examples on websites when I was looking at people's work, and that to me was really rare. And when I was looking at websites, I was thinking, I'd really like to know where this is and what were the examples and if it's relevant to me. Um, all of that to me really seemed like uh, something I wanted to do. Recently, a, uh, a participant in the RBM Level 1 program from last time we just got a, uh, an email from them saying that they really adopted the principles. They had taken almost all the advice we'd given and they were now totally booked for the winter for the first time ever. Uh, and they were being called for a Caribbean job. Now, when I take a look at their website, a really good website, um, they don't have a lot of examples uh, and they don't necessarily classify themselves to one area. So that could mean that you would Kind of put yourself into a little shoebox, which is the point, actually. Um, everybody comes to your website as a yes and maybe or a no. And for me, I want to sort those people as quickly as possible with my website and uh, videos and ad copy so that way they can make the decision without taking any more of my time. So here's the difference between a, a lot of these examples. Um, I get maybe, I don't know, I'm just kind of going off of the numbers me and Rob talk about. I might get 20% of the intake calls that I get, that Rob gets. So I don't get as many good fit calls. Of those calls for land design, I've only had one, two, two in the last year that have decided not to pursue work with me. And the the second one said, uh, they just have to wait until finances come. They, they want to work with me. So I feel from my results that I have a really good... Um, what's called a conversion rate. The people who are calling are actually uh, converting into sales quite easily. Um, now, here's the other piece. Um, on three separate occasions, two, two of which are the current large scope and scale, biggest scope and scale projects I've worked on, um, clients have referenced my portfolio on my website as the reason why they felt ready to contact me and ready to purchase my services. So that works for me for a number of reasons. One, it pairs people down. Two, it brings people through People basically validate themselves or they allow themselves to be eligible to come and do the work. Um, and then I got a chance to work with them. So for me, that really works it out. When I take a look at your guys' portfolio, great examples. I really like the work. Um, I would say that there's a few elements that probably don't suit a professional level of expertise you're looking to communicate. Um, and I'm moving into opinion now. So, you know, I was talking about some experience and now this is just my opinion. I think, especially because you guys are moving into the cannabis industry, you would want to reframe some of the work you've done. 
and reframe it as um, ecological restoration, planning, whatever the words are that your target market will be using, reframe that conversation because arguably the watershed work I saw, the restoration work, all of that could be reframed as whatever it is that's required within the cannabis conversation and of course Chris Moore would know more about that. Um, I think all of that is a really important piece. The second thing is, and uh, I, I don't mean to slight anybody in this, uh, while the renders communicate exactly uh, what you say and what it is, I find that the renders could probably be redone or tuned up for a pretty low cost because you're just basically re-rendering them to somewhere around an arch architectural scale or uh, style just to ensure that you're really communicating that this is a professional company. If you worked with them, you would see the same kind of um, caliber of drawings and renderings you would with any other type of company at this scale, especially if you're moving towards charging um, gazelle or mammoth prices. Um, the second thing I would do is I would pull the rest of the participants in the program, say, what do you guys think of this? What is the message that's communicated to you? How do you think about it? I found your photos to be small and the gallery slider to be a little cumbersome. I'm just going off memory now. Um, I'm curious why you guys chose a, a dark background. Um, it tends to actually create sort of a, a hollow effect where you're kind of looking through something and you kind of have to hunt for things. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm curious why you guys chose a dark um, background and sort of color palette. Um, client portfolio should be examples of what you do and the level of product you can produce as well as the solutions you offer to Island B. So it should show that. I had a, a client last year who was a developer of turnkey um, homesteading companies and they said, I we saw this one thing on your site and we knew you were the guy. So that should be the relationship. And this is a great, for everybody else, this is a great reason for why you would um, take on pro bono work. Um, that would build a huge amount of reputation. For me, portfolio is reputation uh, and a big amount of reputation because it shows the work that I've done. It also needs to be updated. So I've got, I would say at least five more projects that need to go up there. So yeah, I'm, uh, it's not as updated as it, as it could be. A curated spoon can be a pink spoon. Or pardon me, a curated portfolio, not a curated spoon. A curated portfolio can be a pink spoon that works for you without extra time. It's a sales letter that shows your reputation in many respects. And that's what it's been for me. Um, I actually think that uh, a lot of the work that Rob does in terms of modeling and, and some of his um, resilient acreages, especially the ones that are currently being built, would be exceptional pieces to put on his website. Uh, every client that comes to you is a yes and maybe or no. And so you really want to sort them out and sort them out quickly. Hopefully that helps. Mike, how do you schedule six months plus in advance and avoid having to reschedule everything when something goes off track of the planned schedule? Also, how do you avoid creating a sense of not being able to hold to the agreements if you have to reschedule with clients, perhaps multiple times due to factors outside of your control? Um, great questions from Susan, or pardon me, great answers from Susan, great answers from Rob. Um, inform. Uh, if it ever comes down to a legal standpoint, you're going to get into a place where you, you'll have had to have informed the client. What I say now in my contracts is um, I'm available, I'm currently available for this work to begin on X date. Um, if the current work I'm, I'm involved in exceeds that date, I'll communicate delays. I am not beholden to this start date as I work in the physical realm and there are delays outside of my control. When you get into the contracting world with construction, my mom's um, been in it for 35 years, there are a number of punitive actions for this type of work. Um, the uh, delay times incur an incredible amount of cost, which can be then um, collected from the general contractor or the construction company. There's a lot of pieces there, but basically when it comes to the scale of working with clients, I just tell folks, hey, this is when I'm available. Uh, if there's an issue, I'll let you know. Sometimes there is an issue. Know that this isn't a confirmation. It's a confirmation of the earliest time I can begin with you. Um, that usually works out really well. Just be honest with clients, you know. Uh, two years ago when I was working with a couple um, and we were doing a joint effort, uh, there was, we were two months behind and we just communicated with everyone saying, listen, we're extremely apologetic. Um, the, we have what's called the June soons in this little area that I, um, that I was working in. So the, the June rains come and 
they just back everything up and that's just sometimes how it goes so I would just say inform, 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 and make sure that the expectations of the communications follow suit. Hope that helps, Mike. Naomi, regarding to protecting indifference, are there any options for new enterprises support uh, that you know of that may be worth investigating? Uh, what about writing a business plan? How do you guys feel about... Yeah, there's so many questions here, Naomi, so I'm just going to take these um, point by point. Aren't you? In regards to protecting a difference, are there any options for new enterprises support that you know of? Yes, there's huge amounts. Um, nothing against the gents, but the amount of support and grants and all the rest of it for women entrepreneurs outweighs male entrepreneurs by 10 or 15 to 1. I have an old document someplace that has an entire list of all the grants available. At some time, this, this guy had compiled it. I went to this making money management seminar and I got hyped up and I ended up buying it for an exorbitant amount of money. Uh, but it really opened my eyes to all of the grants that are available and the support that's available and the grants and the bursaries and all the rest of it. Basically, you have to realize that when uh, organization, the government and non-for-profit is, is, is offering a grant, it's because it meets the mandate of something they're doing to solve a problem that they feel they can't solve on their own or would be better served by independent, self-directed individuals. So with granting money comes a couple of issues. Um, one, it comes with ties, usually deadlines, and directives and reporting. Uh, I was working on a project where we had to create a pond by February on the coast. Well, during the winter is the worst time to create a pond. Uh, we had a subsurface flow, the pond wasn't completed. Uh, all my recommendations said wait until the summer, end of summer, but just before the rains hit, they didn't do it. Um, so, you know, the constraints of a, of, a, of a grant can actually go outside the laws of nature, as Brad Lancaster likes to say, there's natural law and there's man-made law. And nature always bats, bats last and first. So I think there's that piece there. How about how, what about writing a business plan? Everyone says to do this. Unless somebody requires you to write a business plan for something you want and you really want it, I have never experienced the benefit of writing a business plan. Um, you're going to find a bunch of people who are going to say exactly the opposite. Um, but the way that I work is to test stuff with test stuff, st test businesses and enterprises with um, something called the business model canvas, because I find that's much more uh, accurate and simple. Most businesses come down to one or two numbers in terms of what you charge and what you can produce. Um, basically, what are, what's the, the gross margin or the gross profit? Uh, so I think there's an element there of business plans. If you've never written one, it's a good, good thing to do, because once you've written your first one, you'll go and this is for a loan application and maybe angel investment. But even these days, I've got a couple of good friends who are pitching right now for first and second rounds. And they go in with what's called a slide deck, which is, or a deck, which is, you know, 10 to 12 slides max, major points of the business, major projections, major costs, and gross profit. Like, very rarely have I seen a business plan necessary, and especially not at this level. I would be more interested in um, business, uh, business model canvas. How do you guys feel about loans, grants, temporary, temp, temporary, bridging conventional jobs, etc., to help with the buffer with the FU money, especially when you don't have decent income flow? I love part-time jobs. Love them. They're great. Why? Uh, they're part-time. <laughs> um, I worked in parks for a while because it gave me a huge amount of money for a certain part of time, and then it allowed me to go to school. I was thinking of doing that long-term so I could travel and see the world. Um, I love the part-time job conversation. Recently, Rob and I got a, uh, an email from a participant in an edible landscaping company from the last um, program who was really feeling the crunch in winter, said, I'm just going to get a part-time job at a nursery, still building their skills, which is important. You know, make sure the part-time job builds the skills and connections and conversations. So if you're looking at the granola industry, I would say that's probably um, small-scale food, processing, packaging, um, anything to do with catering probably would be of value to learn. <clears throat> All of that, I think, would be exceptional skills. And would probably give you networking to, to bridge and build the business, plus the cash flow to, to work. Uh, I think it's really important to make sure that you have the cash flow to live. It's one of the reasons why I tried to live on um, $7,500 a year, just to see if I could do it. Because at that point, I realized, well, I can live on nothing. And I can do that ad nauseum. And that gave me the freedom to know that there's so much more out there. So 
Uh, I'm a big fan of part-time jobs. Uh, grants, I've applied for one grant uh, with a co-writer who really took the brunt of the work. I can't, like, putting me as a co-writer uh, on there was purely because I was, uh, yeah, I, I generated the idea and, and a lot of the conversation around the idea, but I didn't write the, the proposal at all. We got $10,000 from uh, Vancouver, yeah, Vancouver Island Regional Health District to build a permablitz network, which is basically getting paid to promote yourself, which is amazing. Lots of report writing to it, lots of deadlines to it, which is great. Kept us on, kept us on the money. Um, can be a great strategic way to go forward. I would not create a business. I'm just my opinion again. I would not create a business that was based upon outside dollars. Uh, it's not a business that is a um, dying corpse that needs to be supplanted with um, outside life. You know, it's on life support. It always needs to go out and find money. And so non-for-profits that don't have economic engines are a, are a big red flag and a big scary thing for me. I've, I've been a part of too many of them to know that that's a bit of an issue. Um, yeah, I think that answers your question. If you have any more questions, ask more. <laughs> uh, John. Since defining the value is so important for the client to understand, how do you define value to things that don't have a clear monetary amount? For example, client A, I have a driveway I don't really use and would love to develop some type of edible garden in its place. There isn't necessarily a direct monetary amount the client is paying for having a driveway they don't like, except inside the light maintenance here and there, but there are a lot of non-monetary value gains, such as an increase in food resiliency, aesthetic improvement, exercise. It's curious on how to frame this when communicating our value clearly and concisely for a potential project where the pain point isn't necessarily directly related to saving massive amounts of money. Um, Rob's uh, questions here are great. They're they're basically the same questions I put down. Um, so I'm just going to run through a few things here. So you during the sales process are a value detective. I want everyone to remember that you're a value detective. You're trying to learn where the value is in hiring you. So bar, part of this is being incredibly empathetic of, of saying, okay, I'm in my client's shoes. Where would there be some value in the work that I'm doing? Uh, and that's where you uncover a lot of interesting things. I uncovered a client with a child who had uh, a medical issue and they were hoping to have some support from this area. Um, I've spoken to people before a, that they want this to be a legacy for their children and for their grandparents and potentially attract other members of the family. And then when you start to hear those things and say, well, what's that worth to you? Like, what's what's the value of that? And you can ask questions of what's been the cost of it up to this point? What's been the cost of it um, going forward? What's been the cost of not having it? That's a good question to ask. I did that this morning with a good fit client. Uh, and for the client this morning, for example, it's a life design situation, so a bit different, but they said, you know, I had to take on $10,000 worth of debt because I don't have a good decision-making process. Perfect. That's a number. Um, so I think that's that's got some value to it. Um, you know, we have this area in our yard and we aren't using it and want to do something with it. It's a very nebulous and very common uh, urban client conversation. So replies can be you know, fascinating. I'm really interested by that desire. You know, tell me more about it. Uh, and that response alone can lead to a good 10 minute explanation. And if you're taking good notes, you can find sort of the, the cracks. So, you know, what's the highest want of that area? Why do you want it that way? The why question is great. The five, seven or nine whys that you reply to something. Um, it's been sourced from a number of places. I always heard it sourced from the Kaizen School of Business. Kaizen being Japanese for constant improvement. Um, what do you want out there? Why do you want there? What is it? Do you want a sense of resilience or ability or food? Um, you know, perhaps um, Rob and I could do a role play at some point if that's desired to kind of show how that interview process might go out. Hopefully that helps. Um, okay, so we got a question from Mike here. Do you ever work with a client who refuses to do a holistic context? At what point... And why did you decide that it was the first step to the journey you provide? How do your clients res respond to that aspect of your service? Okay, cool. So I'll actually um, respond to the second question. Second question first, how and why refuses and respond. Yeah, that's probably the logical order. So um, the best way to find out the organic matter of your soil. 
the best way to find the topographical features of the landscape? What's the best way to find the protein content of a haze sample? What's the best way to find out the precipital values of an area? All of those questions have associated with them a number of different tests or assessments or observations you can make. How do you find out what a client's truest wants and desires are uh, and at the same time give them a tool in which they can manage their decisions going forward, making them more independent, taking more responsibility for themselves, and for me, uh, enacting what is one of the most primary pieces of, of the way that I work, you do holistic context. So when I found out about holistic context going back oh, seven, eight years, I jumped into it, I learned about it, I built my own, I started helping a few others, ran a few workshops, saw the value in it, got incredible feedback and said, this is the test, the evaluatory assessment that I use to understand your goals. Um, when it's framed in that manner, it's just a part of the work you do. And as Rob was saying, and as Susan was saying, the one-on-one -on -one conversations is the easiest way to do it. Um, there's some people who hear about holistic context and come into it and say, I want holistic context, which has been my experience. When it comes to land design, I just say, oh, great. So well, our first step is to get a sense of your goals. And the way I do this is through a process called holistic life context. Okay, great. That's just expectation. It's what you do. So much of life is based upon the expectations that we, we give people. And uh, the theater actually provides a really good example of this. The theater... Uh, has this, if you don't tell the audience you messed up, they have no idea. They'll tell you the whole piece, right? So I think um, all of that is a really good piece. When it comes to holistic life context, you know, I have a, a number of price platforms. I've got a, a free intro video. I've got a free guest instruction for a course. I've got, uh, I'm building a paid introductory course for it. I've got um, holistic life context online course that people can take self-study. I'll be doing a group session in February of 2018. And I've got the one on work I do with people separate from, and then there's the, the land design work, which is just a part of the assessment. So, you know, if folks contract me, I'm going to take a couple soil samples. I'm going to do an analysis of the survey and we're going to assess their wants and needs. I don't use holistic context for urban sites. It just doesn't make sense. They're not enough managed there unless they really want it. But for bigger sites, it's a necessity. So um, people balk at it, which is the other question you had. It's like, great. Uh, I just ask them simpler and simpler questions and it works out really well. I think it, the big thing is when you say, oh, we're going to do a holistic context and it's based on savory and it's based on this, people are like, ah. Uh, we say, good, I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions. We're going to pull out your, your beliefs. And as Rob was saying, you know, speaking with them six times, 30 minutes at a time, reflecting back, oh, yeah, that's true, that's true, that's true. And uh, you can build it really quickly. Um, happy to chat more about that. Great question. Naomi. I'm struggling with indifference, even with holistic context and a sense of burn rate. Could you speak more to the specifics of making better choices about the way you work? Perhaps stuff has to do with the protecting quality of life boundaries, business planning, time, financial management, um, any area of burn rate more useful to look at. Like Rob, I'm a little confused about this question. Um, specifics of making better choices about the way you work. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to answer this a little bit more in the next question, but um, every day more and more, I'm just constantly evaluating, do I love what I do? Because I built up enough FU money uh, and have a number of avenues if I ever needed to, I could make money through. I'm you know, a toe out of the, the money game and hope to be a foot out within a couple of years and hopefully completely out within four to five. Um, so much of that is built upon this conversation of what am I doing and are my actions aligned with what I'm doing? So, you know, every day I'm evaluating, am I doing the work at the right time, at the right interval, with the right conversation? And so indifference from a financial standpoint it comes from having a, another source. Um, me, be it in the background on the savings conversation or just having a job that takes care of the basic burn rate and keeping the burn rate exceptionally low. If you're gonna build a business and you want it to be successful, you need to keep that burn rate low so that way you're not constantly trying to seek sources of money for your you know, non-essentials. 
And for the conventional population that I work with, sometimes that's, you know, Netflix um, or a Spotify account or things that just, you know, cut the entertainment. You've made $45 a month that you can reinvest you know, over a year's time span. We're now looking at what is that? 90, 450, 540. So, you know, it's over 500 bucks. You can invest in more education and conversation. Um, I need to know more, Naomi, about this. So if you want to re-ask this question for this week or next week, that'd be fine too. Mike, what are some of the practices you guys use to create healthy boundaries and about putting your work down at the end of your office hours? Okay, it's gonna be a long answer. So if you're not ready for the long answer, just stop listening. <laughs> so Mike, I wrote pages on this, pages and pages and pages and pages, but it's a really good question. And it's one that I know because we've worked together with before that I really wanted to get down to. So um at the core of your question is at the very center of one of the major issues of consumer capitalistic culture which is really what am i doing and and is that what i want to do most because if it is then boundaries actually come quite easily and i'll explain that so after being uh chronically depressed uh, chronically suicidally depressed for 20 years of my life i was given a great gift i was given the gift of being at the bottom and it's only when you're in the corner of a room can you look around and you can see the whole room. And you're going, okay, I get this now. I know what this is. This is exiting life. These are all the options. What do I want to do here? As I was talking about before, I've lived on $7,500 um, a year. And at times, many more times that amount, knowing that the worst possible scenario or situation of living on less and working less allowed me the cognitive freedom to experiment my, my life to the point to where it suits me best. And I'm constantly innovating. I'm constantly experimenting, trying something new, trying something different. Um, like a broken record to my friends and colleagues, at this point in my life, it's quality of life or nothing at all. I don't, I don't want to have any decrease in quality of life. I'm very specific about that. And I'm, I'm hyper-realistic and almost brutally honest with myself to scrutinize, you know, as quality of life going and seeing... Uh, the next movie or is quality of life waking up better and with less pain it is quality of life um going out to eat at a fancy restaurant or is quality of life having exceptionally good food and actually fasting so i've been really honest with myself about that um this is an interesting piece so before the protestant um reformation we just had catholicism and Catholicism was all about Catholicism. Catholicism was all about duty to God, and the work of a person was was their testament and their tribute and their testimonial to God. The Protestant Reformation from Martin Luther, who differs from Martin Luther King Jr., who I'll talk about in a second, started when he put these ninety nine or ninety eight and ninety seven treatises on this front door of the church, saying, "No, we got to change." And one of the big things was uh, a person's work would be their be the sense of their, their merit. And, and that was the beginning of the meritocracy we live in today, where a person's work has come to mean who they are to the point to where we have a lot of sort of um, banner waving about meaningful work and you have to find meaningful work and that's the purpose of life. That's a really fascinating conversation that actually wasn't really popular in the world until the Protestant Reformation. We're living on a, on a religious dogma that work maketh the man. Um, you know, maketh should have given us the sense of what that means to the point to where uh, Gary Vaynerchuk's crush it and are you killing it are really Protestant epitaph epitaphs of, um, of, of this or over glorification of work. And so I want to kind of give a lot of levels to this answer because you've asked a really good question. And one of them is we have to remove the supremacy of work, period. It's, it's the number one killer of dreams and soul and, possibilities and really good work um, the supremacy of work actually destroys work because the supremacy of work almost necessitates that you do something well regardless of what it is you do which means you're going to miss out on how you're doing it why you're doing it and that you're actually doing it to take the rest of the time off so you can contemplate and think and improve the product to start off with uh I have developed a habit of taking large chunks of time off to cognate or to, to, to reestablish my cognition. I just did it. I took 10 days off to reestablish my cognition. And the first three days of that 
silent meditation retreat called Vipassana is just observing your breath. And it's like you pass out all the junk that's been in your head to the point to where this incredible wave of creativity comes back. And all of a sudden I'm thinking about the business program and thinking about the, the midterm evaluations for you guys, the questions to ask, the conversations, you know, all of this starts really to come to pass. And that all comes because I've got time off and that I'm able to do well because I, I know that the supremacy of work is a lie. It is a, it is a created dogma for a religious agenda that got, that got adopted by a controlling organization to ensure that the people were constantly involved in their work. Great book by Conrad Schmidt, um, The 25-Hour Workweek, really drives into this. Tiny book, uh, Vancouver author. Highly recommend you get the book and read it. He also has a second one, um, Everything in Reality, something of that nature. I think I'm totally off on that, actually. Um, but I think the supremacy of work is an important place to really start to think about and, and break apart and really to take a look that, that that's where meritocracy came from. And... Um, we're actually not just our efforts, but there's so much more to us as individuals. So yeah, our, con our continent uh, is uh, now has a focus on capitalism, uh, which has brought about this, we are our work and we anthropomorphize animals, especially those uh, top apex predators that, you know, a hunter is a lion is a hunter and it's their apex of work. The apex of a lion's day is not hunting. The apex of a lion's day is lounging. It's, it's about being at a, a low entropic state and then going out to hunt only when hunting is necessary. This is the reason why um, bull, uh, bull moose will do an incredible display with their racks. They'll display sometimes for upwards of 45 minutes, like showing this way and showing that way, really trying to gauge, is this worth the effort? Because the reward is propagation of uh, their genetics, but they could be killed in the process. So this idea of like pushing and pushing and pushing is really, really a human thing and doesn't really exist in nature. And again, if we have any basis in um, biomimicry or any sort of natural based principles of design, it, part of it is that it's not about being constantly fed all the time. It's about feast and famine and learning how to store fat. However, that, that plays out in the metaphor. So that really leaves the question, what does one do with their time? As Martin Luther King Jr. said it best, so now we're into the Civil Rights Movement, not the Protestant Reformation, they have a similar name. It's not what a man is willing to die for that's important, it's what he's willing to struggle to live for. So that really then becomes the question, it's like, why am I working in the first place? Why am I actually having this time? Which starts to beg the question, how do we schedule time? So I can't say I know the answer best of, you know, what's life about? Uh, that would be a far greater question than any of this, but... The best answer I found is that the meaning of life is to find our gifts and the purpose is to give them away in a meaningful way. Okay, round two. <laughs> Mike, it's such a big question. So we were just talking about uh, decisions, meaning of life, etc. So once those priorities are known, once those things of why you're living, and I know you've got a couple kids, um, then you can really put everything into stark focus that all your time, unlike my camera right now, because I'm not focused. That was a little coincidence there. Um, so once those properties are known, priorities are known, kids time, time to cognate, uh, expressing yourself, um, you craft your art, the rest comes pretty rapidly and pretty easily. So I'm going to talk a little bit about this yearly calendar that I've been innovating on and um, the value of it. And so uh, I'll probably do a more in-depth video for you guys at some point here. But the short and long was during August, I took some time off. First August I've taken off since I was 10 years old. And I loved it. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> August is my month. It's my birthday. I feel charged. I feel energized. Uh, it's when the mulberries come out. It's when the figs are out. It's when swimming's awesome. It's uh, it's a great time, great time of year. Why would I want to be working? And this really comes back to something that a friend of mine said a couple of years ago, who said um, when I just took my PDC and he was my teacher at the time, and I said, you know, are you busy? Because in Alberta, if you're busy, that's good. Even when I call my grandfather these days, oh, you're busy. Oh, that's good. You must be fine. That's <laughs> no, not. Those don't. 
those don't correlate all the time, <laughs> almost at all. When I'm usually hyper busy, I'm usually hyper stressed and not sleeping well. But anyways, so um, during August, it's a great time. And I think to myself, because this was the first August I'd taken off since I was 10 years old, because I've worked every single summer. I thought, I want to, I want to schedule this right away. So I went and scheduled August, 2018, uh, moved it around a little bit so I could like take in uh, an event and also my birthday and just make sure all that worked out. And then uh, I went back to today. Now, if you were using a physical calendar, it would be the same as using a Google calendar. Now I can't see what's coming up. And I realized that the calendar is an exceptionally interesting device that the way that we see it, the way that it's designed, doesn't actually allow us to forward think and forward look. Furthermore, it doesn't allow us to actually segment what's life and what is the rest of it. So I took uh, my four by eight whiteboard, which is actually something called Frost Free Board, which is a, uh, a product from Home Depot that's used to uh, renovate bathrooms. It's cheap, it's like 40 bucks a sheet. And uh, went from the, the month and the week I was in, I was in like week 32 or 33 of the year, went all, put down all the weeks, all the way out to the next August, and then basically plotted in my vacation next year. Now I could see it. I wasn't going anywhere. And I was looking at it going, this is incredible. But as I looked at it, I started to think, I want to be doing something cool between now and then. Like, what am I doing in six months? And normally I take a couple of weeks off at Christmas, but I didn't have it up on the calendar. So I put that on um, and my partner's daughters come out and my mom comes out and we watch old movies and I bought a foosball table for us to play with uh, and we do crafts and good food and play terrible games. It's amazing. It's so lovely. It's uh, everything I thought Christmas should be. <laughs> um, sometimes friends come up, etc. So then I had that up and then I was like, well, what am I doing in between those times? And so I had a meditation retreat that was coming up, which I just went to. I thought I should actually book the other meditation retreat now. So I did that. I was like, so what's happening in between here? And then I found other things. So now all of a sudden my, my year is really exciting. I'm really looking forward to all these cool things I'm doing. And I realized this is actually holistic context in action. This is the graphic version of holistic context, placing the life designed elements, the, the life activities first and foremost, and then saying, great, I've got this amount of time to do a project, this amount of time, this amount of time, this amount of time. This then plays in really well to contracts and telling people and, and giving people expectations, which I think um, somebody else just asked in another question, actually letting people know when these, these areas exist. So in my contracts, I now have the times that I'm unavailable. And I say, when I, when I believe that this will take 12 weeks, let's say, uh, that does not include this time. So you know, do the math. If we've got four weeks before this time, and then I'm four weeks off in 12 weeks, this is looking more like uh, date to start date to end looking more like 16 weeks. And so that's all really well educated to folks. So that yearly calendar has been exceptional and I could go into a huge depth of calendars and just the research I've done, you know, they're a Roman creation. Most of the months are named after Roman holidays, Roman emperors, Roman gods, or just the names, uh, September 7th, uh, October the 10th. Um, yeah, it's just, yeah, or October the 8th, pardon me, September the 7th, October the 8th, November the, um, the 9th, and then December the 10th. So when we take a look at all of these things that are coming to us, if we don't design our lives, it'll be designed for us. And I think calendars are a really exceptional piece of that. So why I started at the gross level patterns to detail conversation? Well, that big pattern actually sets the conversation for the entire year. Um, and really in terms of the long-term priority and setting time, it, it also sets when you can and, and can't finish a job or when you will or, or, or will not be able to do something. So when, when Rob and I started this program, I said, listen, I've got this for passion. Are you okay to take two weeks by yourself? Um, and I was able to communicate that up front. Um, right. So calendars are artificial. And as soon as you realize that calendars are artificial, then you'll start to realize that most things you can create are of yourself and what's going on. Um, it also means that another gift of, of depression is that I really seek to have the best these days. I seek to have the best time, the best experience, to have filet mignon, as a friend of mine used to say every day. Um, 
And it really means that, you know, for me, my best time is in the morning. So after Vipassana now, I'm waking up at 4.30. I'm meditating from anywhere from 4.30 to 5 to 5.30 to 6. I'm doing an hour of exercise. I'm doing a bunch of um, creative paperwork. That means I'm just getting ideas on paper, not turning on the computer, not being distracted. And then, you know, somewhere around 7.30, 7.38, I'm actually at my computer ready to go. And I've done a lot of creative work. That to me is a filet mignon day. It's, it's not, you know, a food or a hedonistic pleasure. It's actually just being really on point. So that all of a sudden starts to change the conversation because I'm working from a place of um, real strength because I'm going from the priorities of the things I want to live for, not the things I, I, I want to die for. Um, so now that I'm scheduled in advance, there's a couple of things that, uh, a couple of like nitty gritty details here. So in my signature, I update um, the next time I'm off up to six months. So there'll be like time off, vacation, et cetera. So that's always being updated. Uh, in the timing and duration section of my contracts, I know when I'm, I'm away and that uh, the proposed timing of a job doesn't include the time I'm unavailable, which I told you about. Uh, when I, what I include depends on the duration of the job. For example, I'm drafting a contract for a year long engagement and there will be at least four major times I'm unavailable. So that'll be different for that job. I also include times in my signature when I check email. So this is important. I set the expectation Wednesday to Saturday, eight to 12 is when I check emails. If you don't get an email back from me on, you know, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, you're not really surprised because I've already set the expectation. And I've, I've gotten a lot of comments over the years of people saying, wow, I really respect that you put that in there. I have a big signature. That's the other thing. I, I, I'm a little envious of Rob's signature and others when it's just PNG. Here's my number. But I like prefrontal load. Or I love preloading folks in their prefrontal cortex so that way they know what they're expecting. I don't have to do a lot of that. Um, I check email infrequently and I'm on and on my time schedule, not the client. So that's my own business. Uh, and I've got a phone for my convenience, not everybody else's. So Frequently, to the dismay of my friends and family, my, my phone is normally on Do Not Disturb. And I check my email when I'm available because I want to be totally present in what I'm doing. Uh, you'll, you'll say, well, what about, the, uh, what about the, the big problems? It's been three years. There haven't been any big problems. If a family member dies, they're not going to be more dead a couple hours later. Uh, if a project goes really, really poorly and I already know it's it's on the edge, I'll keep my phone on and I'll keep the ringer on because I know, okay, well, that's, you know, that's an oddity. But I think that's also a really good point. You know, if a project's on, on the ropes and it's always, all the projects are always on the rope, that's a pretty good indicator that something has to change. Um, okay, just finishing up here. So yeah, a couple of things that I do in schedule. Um, I do, how do I make... Uh, timing. So I do, uh, uh, currently I do one yearly 10 day Vipassana. I do three to four weeks at Christmas. I do four weeks of vacation in August. I do one workcation, work vacation, two to three days where I just do deep work. That's what I currently do. I'm proposing to do another 10 day retreat a year, two, three day retreats, just mental retreats, meditation retreats, and then uh, one exercise retreat or boot camp just for my body as well. So that's what I'm proposing. So again, this is me putting in life first and then flipping it up. Seasonally, I do, on both equinoxes, I do a three-hour holistic context and yearly calendar review just to get the big arc and give time for the big conversation. Um, during the summer solstice, I'll do a three-hour context and review, and then at New Year's. Um, New Year's is more important to me than the winter solstice always has been. Uh, I want to move to having four seasonal workations where I have two to three days where I work on one project. I had great success last time. I built an entire online course. And I want to do four backpacks. I used to do a lot of backpacking and I just, that really improves my life. Monthly, I do a holistic context check-in once a month, uh, usually at the first week of the month. And I do two weigh-ins and measure-ins for my body. It's just something I do. Weekly, uh, I use Rob's incredible uh, weekly planner. So that schedules me up for the week. I know what are the lead dominoes, what are the weak links I have to work on. Um... I do that usually the day after I've taken time off. So I do the prefrontal cortex Mondays, Mondays, in case I'm taking Monday off, it might be Tuesday. I have two good fit call uh, areas per week, usually like Wednesday afternoon, Thursday morning, because I like doing design early in the week. I do online programs Thursday and Friday. It works best for me. And Monday through Wednesday, as I was saying, as clear as possible for design. Start of my day, I told you guys already, you know, I'm really focusing on being cognitively aware. Generally, I put calls in the afternoon 
And uh, again, yeah, fault, the phone is usually off. Like it's from my convenience, not anybody else's. Mike, hopefully that helps. Um, finally, Richie, how do you identify and address your client's limiting belief while getting paid for the extra problem solving you need to do this? Okay, is this your job? Like, are you taking that on? Have they asked you to do that? I, that's a really big question here, I think, because me and Rob are in this program together and I do that work professionally, that may come across as something we need to do in land design. And uh, sometimes it's none of our business. It's completely out of scope. So I just wanna make sure that comes across well. Sometimes that work is not in scope. If it is in scope, um, I have a couple of processes I use to go through it. Um, you were you were privy to some of those. Um, so I just wanna make sure that you know that's in scope. Um, sometimes, uh, as I working with a client, working with one right now, where there is a belief that they have that's going to affect their business. And I just put it into the report. I say, you guys believe this, it doesn't match up with reality. It affects your business in this way. I suggest you look at that and you, you, you work upon that. So that's an assessment piece. And then last but not least, Will, are there any techniques that could be used when a potential client asks to revisit a project at a time in the future? Yep. So Will, without a CRM, when a client says they need a few months, uh, I ask if they would like me to contact them or they'll contact me. They would like me to contact them. I schedule when that time period will be and send an email usually. I find that they're usually grateful and adapt, adapt, update me of their status. Sometimes we go ahead, other times we're postponed. Being indifferent to the sale, I'm not interested in, in holding their interest. My work's value should be well communicated already and the client um, through the sales call should have a good sense of good fit as well as if they have a sense of uh, that I'm a good fit for them and they're a good fit for me. I tell all clients of my current workload to ensure they're aware that if they engage me at a later time, there's all likelihood I will have delayed the start time. So hopefully that helps. Thanks so much for the questions. Uh, folks, so looking forward to working with you guys this week. I'm gonna work to get this uploaded today. Thanks so much and we will chat very soon. Bye now.